because there's so much that's going on, and it spans from the 3rd century into the 4th century. The problem is some of these figures, these men, uh, men like um, Arius. Um, we're going to talk about Arius sometime. Arius uh, and Arianism, the rise of Arianism and semi-Arianism. And, and th then we have... Um, Oh, uh, origin we talked about, but, you know, origin's one of the reasons why Arianism and other things got to where it was. But Sabellianism, that's another one that we need to talk about. You're looking at me like, what in the world are you talking about? Well, I'll get to it, but you have to understand the, 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 the title of this today is going to be The Rise of Antichrist. Because this is where the beast rises. This is where from the 3rd to the 4th century is where we find that Antichrist system arise, that beast system right here. And we're going to do an, kind of an overview of what it was like. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into it. But, you know, you've, you've got to understand some things here um, that happened here during this time. I, I wanted to get into so many things, but it was hard to figure out where I was going to start. Because it's a hodgepodge of an absolute mess. I guess the third century went from simplicity to absolute complexity. It became very confusing from the third century to the fourth century. I mean, it got confusing. They started arguing about terms that were not even in the scriptures. And then they tried to form doctrines out of those things. And then all out wars took place. And then the rise of Constantine was like the perfect storm. He was a figure that arose at a perfect time for Satan to use to bring on the Roman Catholic apostasy, Babylon, that, and that Antichrist system. Now, I'm going to share some things with you that you may not 100% agree with that Rome is Babylon, that spirit, that whore. Uh, I think it is. I think there's more to it than just Rome, though. I think there's more to it. But I think the gist of it is that antichrist system that arose because nothing is so popular in that sense that where billions of people are part of is Roman Catholicism today. And it's bastardized Christianity. It's antichrist in its in its rising, and, and everything that happened. But there were doctrinal schisms that started in the, midst, uh, in the mid third century. Those schisms that started, those heresies, and those heretics that arose caused an immense amount of problems. And it was all said, what doctrine, Jacob, you probably know this, what doctrine do you think it all centered around? Or what person, I should say. That all of the controversies really center around one doctrine. The greatest attack ever. Arius would have been it. And what was his, he was, he was the number one, right, he was, in Sabellianism. Because Arianism was just a rea was an overreaction to Sabellianism. All right? It was an overreaction. However, what it really comes down to is the deity of Christ. The deity of Christ is what was challenged by all of the heretics. They were all wrong on the deity of Christ. So uh, think about this. What happened in the third century, what was happening in the midst of the third century, you had the Gnostics. You had the Sibelians. You had the Origenist. All right, so, so Origen and his kooky group of philosophers, a bunch of freaks, and you, you had them, and then you had, I mean, they were just a bunch of weirdos. They just were. They were weirdos. They were just phil philosophic weirdos. You get sick of listening to them. When you hear them talk, they just make you sick. They make you want to puke. It's like, shut up already. It's not even Bible. Just shut up. You're arguing about stuff that's not even Bible. It's like a philosophic plate of turds or something it's just it's I, I hate it i i have no respect for it it's just stupidity is all it is there's men that lift up origin i think he's an absolute heretic i think he was a squirrely heretic anybody that cuts off all of his man parts has got to be with him there's got to be something wrong with that man he's definitely got devils in him you have to i don't care what anybody says you gotta have devils in you to do something like that you just absolutely have to 
Amen. I hope you men agree with that. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble. But, uh, <laughs> but right? <laughs> right? You just got to have devils in you. Ain't nobody can be that squirrely unless you got a devil in you like that. You just can't be. Anyway, and I people say, oh, well, the times. I don't care what the times were. That was squirrely. You don't see one, one example of any of that in the New Testament at all. But he came from a school. What's that? No, it wasn't common at all. But what, do, that's what they do to dogs and cattle. Anyway, but um, so here's, yeah, that never does. That's right. God's word is the same. But see, what happened is you had that. You had the rise of, of the originists, then you have the Sabellianism, then you had um, Arianism, which is all mixed in there around the same time. Then you had, so, so you had these battles going on. Then you had, I don't know what I did with that down there. Then you have the Donatists, which they just wanted to follow the Bible. I mean, just, I just, then you had Augustine, right? You had Augustine that arised in the third century or the fourth century. So all these things are happening amidst where's the church at? Where, where's the true church of the living God at? It's in there. It's there. It's thriving. It's very narrow. It's being persecuted. However, Satan changed his tactic in the fourth century. That changed, and that's what we're going to talk about. Last, let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for all you do for us. We pray you'd bless this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. In the third century, we just got left off, and we just, we just heard stories for the last two weeks of the most heinous and wicked acts against the, the martyrs of the faith that you could ever imagine. Right? They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tormented. Right? Right? The Bible says, of whom the world is not worthy. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Right? They, they went through all those things. This was, this was the martyrs. This is what they went through. That, that was Christianity. That was what it was. Remember, these people have their bodies disfigured, their feet cut off, pieces of their feet taken off. You know, they kept them alive for years so they could torture them for years just to try to get them to turn on the Lord Jesus Christ. Beheading was too easy. They Right? So you go from a time like that. Well, imagine if you go from a time like that to all of a sudden... Instead of being martyred and chased and ate, eaten by lions and your babies being killed and your and mothers, you know, babies being ripped from their mother's womb and their arms. Like the last week when we talked about that lady who had a baby like your baby, Lee, ca ca Carrie holding the baby. Then all of a sudden she's the baby is handed off to, let's say, Rebecca. And then and then they, they take Carrie and they martyr her and they murder her. That's what was going on. Right, baby, you're same thing. This this lady last week we talked about that lady. She was eight months pregnant. She had the baby. They took the baby, gave it to her sister, and then they tortured her. Okay, so you go from that. Imagine that to all of a sudden. All of a sudden, no one's killing you anymore, and now there's an emperor that arises. And. He actually makes Christianity the national religion. He actually, he rises up and he starts to, and he starts the heathen temples. He starts to, to make all the bishops and, and all the pastors and he invites them and he, to, to, a, to a wonderful banquet and a feast. And he, and, he, and he gives them their land and he gives them their buildings and he gives them their corporate status. Right? And he, and he wants to dispel the doctrinal disputes that were there. And nobody's getting murdered anymore for the faith, except the Donatists. And, and then no, nobody else is, is, is being tortured anymore. And, and, and now Christians are looked upon with respect. And, they, and, and, they're, and everybody's being nice to them now. And nobody hates them anymore like that. They're not allowed to persecute and kill them. And... They're given money for their buildings and 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 land and 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 they can actually preach now and they don't have to go hide in dens and in caves and in mountains. Right? And in caves of the earth. They don't wander about anymore in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Well, now they're brought into the streets, and instead of instead of their heads being on poles all the way down the sides of the Roman roads, now 
They're paraded out as heroes and, and good people and part of society. That's the gradual change that took place from the end of the third century into the fourth century. So, you know, we're not really going to get strongly into Constantine's rule yet because I want to thoroughly, thoroughly go through Constantine as a person, the kingdom, what he did. He was not a Christian, by the way. Let me shortcut it. He was not a Christian. Let me say that again to you. He was not a Christian. He was not a saved man. I don't care what theologian tells you he was a saved man. Constantine didn't know the gospel if it smacked him upside his head. And he wasn't like King James who ordered the King James Bible to be done. He was nothing like King James. He was absolutely nothing like him at all. Not even close. Similar to Donald Trump? Absolutely. If you want to liken Constantine to somebody, I would say Donald Trump. I would say that would be a good example. In fact, I did a broadcast about that three years ago, four years ago. Because I would say he was the closest thing. Right? So, now we're going to talk about this. And this is from, this is from uh, William, I think it's William Jones's uh, History of the Christian Church of Baptist. And he's going to kind of summarize for us. He's going he's to kind of bring it all together of what took place from then until the rise of Constantine. And explain to you this rise. Th this was a paradigm shift. That's exactly what it would be called. To go from what they went through to being tortured. And, you know, it's, it's hard not to feel for those people. <laughs> And the temptation that they were under. Because remember, some of these people that met at this council, I was just reading this in um, Schaff's history of the church. Um, he, he was talking about, and Schaff's not a Baptist, but he was talking about the council that, that uh, Constantine called together. And I mean, there were people there that were limping in there. They, they, they were martyrs that had been, had made it through. <laughs> And, and they, they, so they were, they were true believers of the faith, but they didn't know they were being seduced. And you got to feel for them because here they are, these people that they're so used to being tortured and beaten, and, and finally somebody doesn't hate them. And they're not killing them anymore. And they actually invited them and paid for their way to come to this, this um, uh, council. I mean, yeah, it, it was kind of overwhelming. And, and instead of, and it's just, wait till I read you next week. Oh, my goodness. You, Eusebius, he gives this gushing thing about, about Constantine at that banquet, and it makes you sick. It's just, oh, it sounds like the political pundits for Trump on yeah, that's what it sounds like. It sounds like Sean Hannity introducing Trump or something. It's really embarrassing. It really is embarrassing. Or one of the pastors, Paula, Pastor Paula, right? Fake Pastor Paula. Yeah, like they're, they're addressing him like he's, it's just ridiculous. It's, you see, he was so, he was, he was an Aryan too, by the way. But uh, anyway, um, all right, so we're going to get into this a little bit, and then we'll, get, we'll be in a bunch of scripture here too. Because he goes, but he's going to tell you the rise of the Antichrist beast system. We're going to show you how uh, we go from the third century into the fourth, and it can be, it's that paradigm shift. It's the rise of Antichrist. This is where, this was the danger. You know, it ain't half bad being afflicted and tormented a lot of times. It just isn't. You know, some of the hardest things I've been through, uh, afflictions and things of that nature, they, uh, Brother Paul and I, we were just talking about that, Brother Paul, how that, their breakdowns are good. <laughs> we just, you know, going through some of that, they're good for you. You know, being afflicted like that, having that, they're good for you. They produce, God uses that in your life. When everything, when the sun is shining, everything's going good, and everybody loves you, oh, man, that's when you get in trouble. When you're at the height of popularity, that's when you're in a lot of trouble. You know, it's, it just is. In reviewing the history of the Christian church from the first propagation of the gospel until the reign of Constantine, it can scarcely fail to strike the reader's attention that the Christian profession is marked during this period with a peculiar character. 
in distinction from what is sustained after the accession, ascension of Constantine to the throne. When the Christian religion was taken under this, under his fostering care and supported by the civil government. See, this is when the marriage of civil government and Christianity came together. Now, let's be honest. What came together was Roman Catholicism with the Roman government. The power of the sword and the Roman hierarchy came together. So the sword of the Roman, uh, the the kingdom of Rome, right? The, The government of Rome, the beast, came together with religion. And they came together. But there was a true church of people that said, you know, I don't think so. But understand that that's when the change happened. So here's what happened. So here you have. Because not everybody was welcome to the party. Because as soon as they were invited, some people said, eh, I don't think so. I don't know if I want to be a part of that party. Right? Yep. See, the first propagation of the Christian faith was not only unaided, but directly opposed in most instances by the civil government in the different countries in which it spread. The publishers of the gospel were in general plain and unlearned men destitute of all worldly influence and power. Their doctrine was in s- itself obnoxious, and their appearance little calculated to procure it a favorable hearing. Nor could they present to the view of men any other inducement to embrace their testimony than the prospect of life and immortality in the world to come with the certainty that through much tribulation believers must enter into the kingdom of God. The success of their doctrine stood in direct opposition to the power of princes. The wisdom of philosophers, the intrigues of courts, the enmity of the pagan priesthood with all the weight of an established system of idolatry and superstition. It could therefore only make its way by sustaining mid overcoming the malice and rage of its enemies. See. It it wasn't going to be. It wasn't going to Christianity would. Biblical Christianity, the church, the Lord's churches, they always thrived when people hated them. When everybody loved them, they didn't do very well. So when Constantine decided that he was going to take the Lord's churches and he was going to sanction them, approve them, he merged them. By the way, this was warned about, we'll talk about. In the view that we have taken of the Christian history during the preceding period, it appears uniformly in harmony with this representation. The general character of the disciples of Christ is that of a suffering people. And notwithstanding some intervals of repose, occasionally intervening, in general, the progress of the gospel is traced in the blood of the saints and its power and evidence made conspicuous in prevailing against the most formidable opposition. See, the churches, do you understand that the churches thrived more in suffering and persecution than they did under Constantine. They lost their power under Constantine. Oh, they gained political power. They lost spiritual power. What do the evangelicals in America, what have they done? They've gained political power, but what have they lost? Hey, let me ask you a question. Let let me ask you a question. Has the evangelicals' political power with the pro-life movement stopped babies from being murdered? No. But let me ask you this. Before that political power, and back in the days of the Sandy Creek revival and all those other revivals when they were being persecuted and all those things happened, um, there wasn't any abortion, was there? Not legally sanctioned. What did... uh, What did... James Madison fear. He feared John Leland 
and John Leland stand as a Baptist, and all the Baptists said, you know what, no, we're not going with you. We don't even need you. But instead, now they've picked a leader to yoke up with. The evangelicals have. Right? Thus the excellency, its power appeared to be of God and not of man. While the Christian cause was thus opposed to the world and made its way by its own divine energy, the general purity of its profession was preserved. For what could induce men to embrace it but a conviction of its heavenly origin and importance? So long as the Christian profession was thus circumstanced, its success carried with it its own witness. But the scene is altogether changed when we view the state of matters after the ascension of Constantine, for then, instead of the teachers of Christianity being called upon to show their attachment to it by self-denial and suffering for its sake, we see them exalted to worldly honor and dignity. And holy and heavenly religion of Jesus converted into a system of pride, domination, and hypocrisy. And becoming at length the means of gratifying the vilest lusts and passions of the human heart. I, I want you to think about this for a second. You have these churches today that have built these million do multi-million dollar facilities. And they are begging the state to let them assemble with them. They signed away with that 501c3. They did this. Listen, Constantine incorporated the churches then, too. This is not new. People just get mad at me when I mention it. But those churches that are incorporated, Constantine incorporated those churches. He was the first to incorporate churches. Do you, do you understand that? Go back and do the study. He incorporated those churches. Because the pagans were incorporated. The pagan temples were incorporated. So he did the same thing. The consequence of such a change in the state of things may be easily anticipated by those who have any proper views of the corruption of human nature. And it corresponds with matter of fact. For no sooner do we perceive the teachers in the church who had hitherto been the foremost in sustaining the opposition of the persecuting powers and animating their flocks to a, pa a, pa a passion a patient continuance of bearing the cross. No sooner do we see them invested with secular honors, immense wealth, and elevated to dignity than the first object of their lives seems to have been to maintain their power and preeminence and aspiring at dominion over the bodies and consciences of men. Right? From the days of Constantine, the corruption of the Christian profession proceeded with rapid progress. Many evils probably existed before this period, which prepared the way for the event that were to follow. But when the influence of the secular power became an engine of the clergy to be exercised in their kingdom, it need not be a matter of surprise that the progress became exceedingly rapid in converting the religion of Christ into a system of spiritual tyranny, idolatry, superstition, and hypocrisy until it arrived at its full height in the Roman hierarchy when what is called the church became the sink of iniquity. this you wonder when did this happen right here this is when the wholesale sell out sell out of the churches took place and it always happens under the guise of help it always happens under the guise of helping us they wanted to help them you know what all the baptists always wanted just leave us alone just just leave us alone we don't want anything from you we'll even pray for you just leave us alone just just leave us alone what did the donatists ask of augustine and, and constantine and all those when they when they went after him and tried to steal their church we don't want your bishops just leave us alone we don't want anything from you just leave us alone we just want to be left alone oh we'll get into it we we got it we're going to talk about it the Edict of Milan, 
the edict against the Donatist. We're going to be Park on Constantine, the Donatist. If you're, we're going to be there for a while. It's going to take a while to, to get through Constantine and to understand what really happened. Man, I'll tell you what. Looks like a friend, but smells like a skunk. Just like Trump. Looks like a friend, but stinks like a skunk. Didn't do one thing to stop abortion. Or stop the homosexual agenda, being a Christian at all. But he had a religion just like Constantine, because Constantine's the same way. Remember, Constantine, you don't know this, but Constantine killed his own son. But you didn't know that. Good Christian man he was. Killed his own son. Nice fella. Did a lot worse than that, too, but we'll get to that. We, we won't talk a lot about him today, but we're just setting up. So you understand, you got to get set up for it. You got to understand where you're, wh- what happened. That such a display of human depravity as we shall see, as we shall have to detail in the succeeding events of church history should be exhibited under a profession of Christianity may very reasonably excite our astonishment. <laughs> you're like, this is actually Christianity? Well, not really. <laughs> Many indeed without discriminating between Christianity and its corruptions. Just remember, a lot of times people judge us by the corruptions of Christianity, not true biblical Christianity. Right? That's right. When you sin, you give the enemies of the Lord uh, reason to blaspheme. Many indeed without discriminating between Christianity and its corruptions have found that they what they conceive a sufficient justification of their own skepticism in the many abominations which have been and still are committed under the Christian name. And it must be allowed that it is one of the most plausible and successful arguments in encouraging and supporting a skeptical state of mind to paint the Christian system as it appears, the engine of priestcraft and the support of spiritual tyranny, idolatry, and superstition. But genuine Christianity is no more accountable for these enormities than what is called the religion of nature is for all the absurd and superstitious rites of paganism. It may be proper, therefore, to observe that the greatest iniquity that has been discovered in what is called the Christian church, admitting the evil in its full extent, is but the accomplishment of what was before predicted in the sacred scriptures. And considered in this view, it presents us with the most powerful argument in confirmation of the prophetic word. In the establishment of Christianity by Constantine, the obstruction which had hitherto operated against the full manifestation of the anti-Christian power being removed, the current events gradually brought matters to that state in which the man of sin became fully revealed sitting in the temple of God and showing himself as God. He's talking about who? The Pope. The, he's talking about the few, right, but the Pope. But he's talking about that final Pope. He's talking about the Antichrist. That's what he's talking about. A system of men that would come, that would sit sit in the temple of God, saying they are God. What does what does the Pope call himself? The what of Christ? And what does that mean? What does the vicar of Christ mean? Right. What's that, Brother Paul? Did you say something? Okay. What did you say? No, in place of, right. Yeah, he represents Christ on earth. So he sits in the temple of God saying he is God. Say that again. Which is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Sits on Lucifer's throne right there in the Vatican. The apostles of Jesus. Now, see, what he's saying is what Jones is saying right here is this. Jones is saying that, listen, now, if you're paying attention this was all prophesied about. We're going to get to those verses. This, this was all prophesied about. What was coming in the 4th century, Paul warned about that it was coming. He said, this is happening. This is already, John said it's already. The Spirit is already out there. But it is happening. It's coming. The apostles of Jesus Christ gave many intimations in their writings of the corruptions which should arise under the Christian profession at a future period. They said they would call themselves Christians. 
There were not wanting symptoms of this even in their own days, as appears from the following passages. When the Apostle Paul delivered to the elders of the church at Ephesus a solemn warning to take heed to themselves and to the flock over which the Holy Ghost had made them overseers. Turn to Acts 20. Verse number 29 and 30. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. The jealousy and fear which he entertained relative to the influence of false teachers is manifest in the following passages. He said this in 2 Corinthians 11. Turn there, 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 3. Oops, that's 10. But I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled did Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Verse number 13, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers. What's the Pope call himself? An apostle. Apostolic secession. Yep. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. He says he's an apostle of Christ. Successor to Peter. And no marvel. For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. The same general caution against the effects which should proceed from false teachers is very plainly given to us in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse number 1 through 3. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words. What's that word mean? Fake words. Feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Those are your memorization verses for this week. Second Peter chapter one, or, or Second Peter chapter two, verse one through three. Verses one through three. To these passages and many others that might be adduced as calculated to awaken the attention of Christians to the dangers they should be exposed to from corrupt teachers, we may particularly add the following, as is not only foretells but describes the nature of the apostasy that should take place and at a period remote from the time when the predictions were delivered. First Timothy 4.1, we did these verses, didn't we? Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Those are, that's Roman Catholicism. That's the papacy. That's Constantine. So you have a man and you have the system. Again, this know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. What do they have? A form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. From such turn away. But of all the predictions contained in the New Testament, 
the most particular and expressed description of the anti-Christian power that should arise under the Christian name. That's what you have to understand. And we've been talking about, and I, I, you know, irrespective of this teaching, I've told you that in our own ministry, in our own lives, the people, the false prophets and those and others that are out there, that they will come in the name of Christ when they do what they do. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one through ten. In these verses, we see the embodiment of the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beastly system that is to arise. Now, the, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, we know that the last, and we don't know who that's going to be, and we don't know how that's going to happen. We know there's a system there in place, a beast system. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. What does he do? Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. So that he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things, and now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. That's not yet, right? It hasn't happened yet. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Okay? So, I, Jones says this. He says, In this representation of the apostasy from the purity of the Christian faith and its influence, which terminated in the man of sin sitting in the temple of God, we may notice the following particulars. Number one, that the apostle describes its origin as taking place in his own day. He said the mystery of iniquity doth already work. So in his time, he said it was happening. It was already at work. The seed was then sown. Idolatry was already stealing into the churches. A voluntary humility and worshiping of angels was already taking place. Men of corrupt minds destitute of the truth, supposing that gain was godliness and teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. Men of this cast appear to have early abounded and is acting not wholly in direct opposition to Christianity, but corrupting it in a way of deceit and hypocrisy. Simon Magus. During the whole progress towards the full revelation of the man of sin, there was no direct disavowal of the truth of Christianity. It was a form of godliness without the power of it. Number two, there is an evident in intimation in this passage of an obstacle or hindrance in the way of his power. Now, this is very interesting. Okay? He says, now we know what withholdeth that, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed. Now, it's interesting, his take on it. And I, I think he's got a, a point to the application. I think he's right. I think there's an application to this here. Without going into any minute and critical examination of these verses, it is obvious that the wicked power, which is here the subject of the apostles' discourse and denominated the man of sin, had not been fully displayed and that there existed some obstacle to a complete revelation of the mystery of iniquity. The apostle uses a particular caution when hinting at it, but the Thessalonians, he says, knew of it, probably from the explanation he had given them verbally when he was with them. It could scarcely be questioned that the hindrance of the obstacle referred to in these verses was the heathen or pagan Roman government, which acted as a restraint upon the pride and domination of the clergy, through whom the man of sin ultimately arrived at his power and authority, as will afterwards appear. The extreme caution which the apostle manifests in speaking of this restraint renders it not improbable that it was something relating to the higher powers, for we can easily conceive how improper it be, would have been to declare in plain terms that the existing government of Rome should come to an end. 
So he's speaking of the Roman government that it kept back at the time of Rome persecuting. the. As long as Rome was persecuting the Christians, the clergy could never reach a place of like magnitude like they did. It was not until the Roman government accepted Christianity, uh, corporatized Christianity, and made it an established religion that apostasy could set in. So he's saying that from an earthly perspective, he's saying that he that now let let until he be taken out of the way, he's saying that it was that power of government that restrained, that God used the power of the Roman government to restrain the, the, the height of that apostasy. But then eventually that man of sin would be revealed, that system would be revealed, and then it would be able to carry off its apostasy. But in the apostles' days, they were too busy mart- being martyred and, and, and killed. It's interesting. It's an interesting theory. But it's also interesting because Tertullian says something that's interesting, too, to that, that effect. I think there's more to it than this, okay? But I think this, isn't, there, this application is not without warrant because we've seen it. We've seen the, the, the height of apostasy, the rise of the power of the Roman papacy. By the way, if you think Rome has lost one ounce of power, you're crazy. They have lost nothing. And I have a friend that, that, that he believes that it's the Jews. And I, I'm like, well, the, but the Bible says it's the time of the Gentiles. And, it said, and they said, we have no king but Caesar. So the Jews gave their allegiance to the papal throne. They already gave their allegiance. I don't care what you see out here with these rogue Jews that are millionaires and billionaires and all this stuff. They don't have the power to walk into any country all over the world and have 100% immunity. You know know what Obama said about the Pope years ago when all the sexual molestation charges were against Benedict for covering up all the molestation and everything else? They asked Obama about it, and you know what Obama said? Well, the Pope can't be sued. He has complete immunity. He said that. Why? Because he runs the show. Oh, he doesn't have all that money. Look, by the way, first of all, he doesn't need all the money when he has the devils. When you're full of devils and you're, and you're actually running an antichrist system like he is, and you're up at the top and you literally sit on a throne that's Lucifer's throne, when you literally, I mean, you, you, don't, need, you, you, don't, you don't need all the money. All the money comes to you, and you do whatever you want. By the way, how else do you explain a man that sits on a golden throne, right, with a golden cup in his hand, but tells you that you're a bunch of greedy capitalists over here in America trying to make money, and you ought to give it to the poor? Yeah. (laughs) Right. I mean, yeah, he had his throne and everything. I mean, it was just like great, wasn't it? No, the Bible says Jesus left his throne on high and made himself a man, didn't he? Total opposite, total anti-Christ. There is a remarkable passage in Tertullian's apology that may serve to justify the sense which Protestants, he calls them, put upon these verses. And since it was written long before the accomplishment of the predictions, it deserves the more attention. Christians, says he, are under a particular necessity of praying for the emperors and for the continued state of the empire because we know that dreadful power which hangs over the world and the conclusion of the age which threatens the most horrible evils is restrained by the continuance of the time appointed for the Roman Empire. This is what we would not experience This is what we would not experience, and while we pray that it may be deferred, we hereby show our goodwill to the perpetuity of the Roman state. Why was he saying that? Because he was like, as long as they're killing us, we're good. As soon as they like us, we're toast. The whole world's done. He knew what was coming. He knew that if the apostasy, he knew that when the, look, the apostasy had not set in until corporate church. That's when the apostasy set in. Yes, there were apostates always. But the point is, the apostasy never set in 
until Constantine established Christianity. Now, when I say established Christianity, please understand I don't mean biblical Christianity. Although, you must understand, those, many of those people were still saved people. Many of them were wrong. Many of them were saved. There was a time when their doctrine did not differ irrespective of the... This happened, you have to understand. Okay, let me give you an example. When you're deceived, have you ever noticed how it doesn't happen all at once? It's a slow process of deception. Well, let me ask you a question. If a guy quit, st if a guy stabbed you every day and you just, I mean... And then all of a sudden, he didn't stab you anymore. I mean, people weren't killing you anymore. People weren't, I mean, what do you think that does to the mind? You know what I mean? Their battle changed. Our battle in America is not persecution today, yet. You know what our battle is? To remain faithful through the apostasy. To not lose our fire, our zeal, our love for God, and not love this world too much. That's our battle. Our, your battle is, is, is at this time is not that you're going to lose your head or somebody's putting you on a rack. That could happen someday. Oh, no. You see, here's what people don't. You know what? There's a lot of people that want to go over to Africa and be a missionary. And I'm not against that. Uh, starting churches over in Africa. I'm not against that. You know, you know where the hardest spot in the world to start churches are? Right here in America. You want to know why? Apostasy. Comfortability. Rich and have need of nothing. Right? What is the sin of Sodom? Pride. Fullness of bread. Idleness of hands. Isn't that America? Look, they're literally paying people $600 a week to stay home. So wait a minute, you're paying people to be in direct rebellion to God when God tells them to go to work. Now, I'm not saying you're wrong if you're forced to stay home. That's not your fault. What I'm saying is, that's them. That's what they're doing. That's their plan. Do you see how that's antichrist? But see, that's the point. Our battle is what their battle was in the 4th century. Because now nobody's killing them. Now you got to stay true when everybody's trying to flatter you. Oh, my goodness, do I know how that is. <sighs> you know, when everybody hates you and nobody likes you and, and, uh, and all that stuff, and, and you're battling on and you're being persecuted and everything else, you, 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 you don't become – but when everybody starts being nice to you and buttering you up like a turkey so they can roast you in the oven – they start pouring accolades on you. They start pouring nice things on you. They, they, they start flattering you constantly with everything. Oh, man, I'm telling you, that's when you're in for a fall if you're not careful. And see, that's what happened to them. From this extract, it manifests that Christians, even in Tertullian's time, 120 years before the pagan government of Rome came to its end, looked forward to that period as pregnant with calamity to the cause of Christ. Though it is probable they did not accurately understand the manner in which the evils should be brought on the church, and this indeed, the event proved to be the case, for while the long and harassing persecutions which were carried on by the pagan Roman emperors continued, and all secular advantages were on the side of paganism, there was little encouragement for anyone to embrace Christianity who did not discern somewhat of its truth and excellence. Many of the errors, indeed, of several centuries were... were the fruit of vain philosophy paved the way for the events which followed, but the hindrance was not effectually removed until Constantine the emperor, on professing himself a Christian, undertook to convert the kingdom of Christ into a kingdom of this world. By exalting the teachers of Christianity to the same state of affluence, grandeur, and influence in the empire as had been enjoyed by pagan priests and secular officers in the state, the professed ministers of Jesus, having now a wide field open to them for gratifying their lust of power, wealth, and dignity, the connections between the Christian faith and the cross was at an end. 
What followed was the kingdom of the clergy supplanting the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Yes. No, that's that's right. That's what they did. But see, this is where it happened. The rise of Constantine is why it could happen. Because, see, you already had some men that were metropolitanites. At the end of the third century, you had these men in Rome, Ephesus, and these others that had these old churches that had been around for a long time. And people looked to them, and then they had councils, and then they had control, and then they excommunicated each other, and then there was battles and wars between them, and little churches out in the middle of nowhere had to follow this big big box church, and if they didn't, well, then they were in trouble and all this other stuff. That, so then when, they, when these men that were full of lust and envy and covetousness got an opportunity of control, power, corporate church, big buildings. By the way, that wasn't the only time people say, well, they didn't have meeting houses. That's not true. They met wherever. They met anywhere. This is when corporations were started. Tax-exempt corporations were started. Constantine incorporated them. They had the same rights as pagan priests did. So then they're lauded. It is worthy of observation in what language the apostle describes the revelation of the man of sin when this hindrance or let should be removed. And then shall that wicked be revealed whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all the sinfulness of unrighteousness in them that perish. He had before described this power and personified him as the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Every feature in this description corresponds to that of a religious power in the assumption of divine authority, divine honors, divine worship, a power which should arrogate the prerogatives of the Most High, having its seat in the temple or house of God, and which should be carried on by Satan's influence with all deceit, hypocrisy, and tyranny. And which, and with this corresponds the figurative representation given in Revelation chapter 13, verse number 5 through 8, which we know will happen one day. All is set up for it. Let's see how much farther we have here. We're almost done. As many things in the Christian profession before the reign of Constantine made way for the kingdom of the clergy, so after they were raised to stations of temporal dignity and power, it was not wholly at one stride that they arrived at the climax here depicted by the inspired apostle. Neither the corruption of Christianity nor the reformation of its abuses was effected in a day. Evil men and seducers waxed worse and worse. There was a course of mutually deceiving and being deceived. The conscience of man is not blunted at all, all at once against the convictions of guilt. And there is something uncommonly expressive in the apostle's words when he describes the blessed God as giving men up to strong delusions, that they all might be damned to believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And this he represents as the necessary consequence of their not receiving the love of the truth that they might be saved. In the sequel, it will appear that when the bishops were once exalted to wealth, power, and authority, this exaltation was of itself the prolific source of every corrupt fruit. Learning, eloquence, and influence were chiefly exerted to maintain their own personal dominion and popularity. Contests for preeminence over each other became the secundinium of the ancient contention for the faith and its influence over the world. Power was an engine of support to the different factions and the sword of persecution, which for three centuries had been drawn by the pagans against the followers of Christ. The besotted ecclesiastics employed against each other in defense of what was now called the Holy Catholic Church. The history of this church from the ascension of Constantine to the period when the Bishop of Rome was elevated to supreme authority discovers a progressive approximation to that state of things denoted in Scripture by the revelation of the man of sin sitting in the temple of God. 
all the violent contentions, the assembling of councils, the persecutions alter alternately carried on by the different parties were so many means of preparing the way for the assumption of spiritual tyranny and the idolatry and superstition of the Roman hierarchy. In all these transactions, the substitution of human for divine authority happened. They substituted, they sought counsels instead of the scriptures. They sought men's opinions, the philosophies of men. All those origin, Sabalianism, um, Arianism, all of those things were all philosophies of men. Calvinism, if you will, whatever ism you want to want to call it, Armenianism, all of it. Are there truths in some of those systems? Absolutely. But I don't have to wholesale accept any of their systems. Uh, neither will I deny the truth that, that is in them. But I will not wholesale follow any of their philosophies because I don't need to. I am not. I am not in subjection to men's systems. We are in subjection to the word of God only. Our creed is our scriptures. I don't have to follow everything Spurgeon said, Calvin said, or any or Armenian said, or any of those people. If they said truth, then I'll give them that. But if they lie, or if they or if they leave the truth, if they turn to the right hand or to the left, I don't have to follow them. Why? Because some guy said there's two systems out there, Calvinism and Armenianism, and I must follow one of them? Why? Why do I have to? Can I not see the truth in things and discern the truth? Am I, do, do I not have an unction from the Holy One and know all things? Uh, aren't I able to look through the scriptures and say, well, I don't think I agree with that. See, this is what happens when you try to put Christianity, biblical Christianity and the faith once delivered unto the saints into a philosophical system of any kind. When, when you do that, you end up falling over one side or the other. Always. So I've learned from men that have called themselves Armenians. I've learned from men that have called themselves Calvinists. I've learned from Baptists. I've learned from Protestants. I've learned from many people. And I've learned from Catholics not to kill people. Um, but, <laughs> but um, right? By not following their example. <laughs> okay, let me see where I was at here. Yep, here we go. Okay. In all these transactions... The substitution of human for divine authority, contentions about words instead of the faith once delivered to the saints. Pomp and splendor of worship for the primitive simplicity and worldly power and dignity instead of the self-denied labors of love and bearing the cross. This baneful change operated in darkening the human mind as to the real nature of true Christianity until in process of time it was lost sight of. When Jesus Christ was interrogated by the Roman governor concerning his kingdom, he replied, my kingdom is not of this world. What did Constantine try to do? Make Christ's kingdom of this world. This is a maxim of unspeakable importance in his religion and almost every corruption that has arisen. Listen. Uh, this is your this this is a good quote. Jesus said, "My kingdom is not of this world." So here's going to be one of your questions here because this is true about every apostasy. He says this. He says this is a maximum of unspeakable importance in his religion and almost every corruption that has arisen and by which this heavenly institution has been debased from time to time may be traced in one way or another to a departure from that great and fundamental pr uh, principle of the Christian kingdom. So here's here's what it is. Here's here's the here's the question. What has produced more errors? 
from Christianity than anything, and it, and it is this. It is losing sight of that Christ's kingdom is not of this world. Every diabolical and wicked error that has taken place has taken place because people in Christian churches have lost sight of that God's kingdom is not, Christ's kingdom is not of this world. So, Tell me, uh, let's see, Jacob, how does that relate? How does that relate to the martyrs? How do we know that if, if Christ's kingdom is not of this world, uh, or no, not to the martyrs, let's go to the Protestants that persecuted the Baptists. Why, how did they deviate from this kingdom not being of this world when they persecuted the Baptists? Exactly. Right, and they use the sword, right? That's right, dominionists. They use the sword, just like Roman Catholicism did. They use the sword against their brethren and said, well, if you're a heretic, well, then we have the right to kill you. No, 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 Christ, Christ never killed anybody. You know not what manner of spirit you're of. That's what Jesus said to them. You know not what manner of spirit you're of. There's your second question. How did Protestants deviate from understanding from their understanding of Christ's kingdom not being of this world when they persecuted Baptists? That's a long one, but you'll get it. I'll ask you the question next week. But how did they? And this is how they did. They forgot that Christ said, you know not what manner of spirit you are of. For Christ came to what? Save men's lives, not destroy them. Christ never said use the sword To slay heretics or to kill all non believers or to banish them or to persecute them. They were never to use the sword. Christ's kingdom was not of this world and is not of this world. That's right. It may, therefore, be of most importance to the reader to keep his eyes steadily fixed upon it while perusing the following pages, as that alone can enable him to trace the kingdom of the Son of God. Listen, listen, this is good. I like this comment. You can tell he's a Baptist. Listen, listen to what he says here, because it's true. This, this, is, this is the crux of it right here. I'm gonna, I'll start. It may, therefore, be of importance to the reader to keep his eyes steadily fixed upon it while perusing the following pages, as that alone can enable him to trace the kingdom of the Son of God amidst the labyrinths of error and delusion which he will presently have to explore. Because I'm telling you what, e I was confused. I was like, where do I start this mess? Because the fourth century is such a mess. And see, I know this is Baptist history, but you have to explain where the Baptist kept going and the apostasy was all around them. And there was a true church that continued on. That represented that kingdom that is not of this world. You, you got to find them. So remember your Baptist distinctives. Remember that as we explore the fourth century. Remember that as we look at Constantine. And we look at the state church. Remember that who those men were and remember that Christ's kingdom was not of is not of this world for then would my servants fight so that's the, that's the overview just the beginning not even really the beginning just a brief over what yeah the, the, what's that? The beginning to the beginning. Because, I mean, when we start with, con there are so many figures that, that factor into this fourth century and a wholesale change that takes place. Doctrinally, I mean, we have to talk about those things. Sabellianism, Arianism, Augustinism, Constantinism. <laughs> right? It makes you wonder, but we have the benefit of looking back. But there were men that saw that, okay? But it makes you wonder how the other men didn't look at Constantine and be like, that guy's a devil. But they did. The Donatists, they understood. 
right? A lot of those men understood what was going on. But it makes you wonder why, like, other people didn't be, uh, more Christians weren't like, wait a minute. Well, part of it was because of, it's just like with Donald Trump. All these people have been mesmerized by Donald Trump. I mean, when you see, they're so giddy and excited. I'm like, this is the same guy's, I mean, you realize, like, the wife that he has, like, was in Playboy. I mean, like. (laughs) Yeah, pornographer, right? Um, yeah, that Donald Trump has made all his money off of vices. Right. That literally he pushed the sodomite movement after he got it more than any other president. That all these other things are transpired, and yet you're calling, I mean, he literally is Constantine. But these people are just like, well, yeah, but he's pro-life. Not really. While I'll give him this, he killed a a lot less people than most of those men do with wars and everything. He stopped a lot of that. I'll give him that from that space. I I can't. I'm not going to. That was that's just the truth. He he wasn't like a war machine, you know, compared to the other ones. But. The point is, he didn't have as many. But that's what I'm saying. That second one might be worse. More happened. That's true. Yep, that's true. But, yeah, that's true. I guess so. The vaccine. So the warp speed to kill them all. And he start. Hey, and he started Space Force. So, for fighting aliens. But anyway, you can see how Christians were so mesmerized by a figure like Donald Trump, where all of these high-level evangelicals and all these people are, like, lauding Trump. But not all of them. Just like in history, there's been a group of us that have said, "Uh uh-uh. He offered them money. They took their money. To the tune of billions of dollars. That is the beginning of the fourth century. And history has a way of repeating itself. That's right. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you prophesied all of this coming. We're not surprised by it in that sense, Lord, because you've already told us it would come. But help our hearts to be ready for it. And Lord, help us to be diligent. Help our lights to be burning bright. Help us not to hide our lights, but shine them bright in this apostasy. While we live in relative comfortability, may we use it for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ to see sinners saved. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Also, um, New Year's Eve. Is that a Thursday, Brother Paul?